President Trump is reportedly preparing to pardon more soldiers accused of or even convicted of war crimes. That includes this man, Navy SEAL Edward Gallagher. He's scheduled to stand trial for allegedly shooting unarmed civilians in Iraq and also stabbing a captive to death. Another man reportedly under consideration, a former Blackwater security contractor named Nicholas Slatton. A federal jury convicted Slatton in the deadly shooting of dozens of unarmed civilians in Baghdad at the height of the Iraq war. The president is also examining the case of Major Matthew Goldstein. Goldstein is a Green Beret charged with killing an unarmed man linked to the Taliban. Now that's all on top of the pardon he's already issued for a former Army lieutenant named Michael Behenna. He served five years for killing an Iraqi man while he was in American custody. Well, my next guest says that freewheeling pardons undermine the entire system. Gary Solis, he's an adjunct professor at Georgetown Law School. He's also a retired Marine, where he was a company commander in Vietnam, and is also a former military judge. Thank you, Gary, for the time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Uh, you know, I read some of the comments, and I, and I know there's no such thing as a uniform of opinion, but... There was a lot of outraged uh, veteran groups that said that this is tantamount to a war for ISIS and our enemies. Uh, one saying that uh, it's a slap in the face for everyone who fought honorably. Another one saying that doing this, you know, on around Memorial Day, as it's rumored here, um, with the exception of actually pissing on graves at Arlington, pardoning war criminals on Memorial Day is as insulting to America's war dead as you can possibly get. Do you get a sense, uh, there's a consensus in the veteran community that what the president's considering is bad? Or is there an actual, you know, uh, split line, whether on partisan fronts or whatever, as to con being conflicted about this possible choice? Well, inevitably, there are two sides to this within the vet uh, veterans community. But among those who I know, they are universally against pardoning these individuals and very much against it in a very loud voice. Now, as I say, I'm sure there are those who think it's a great thing, but nobody in any command authority that I've talked to or know of. You know, the story of Chief Gallagher, to me, defies the logic as to warning a pardon. If you believe the accounts of it, he was legendary in the SEAL community, and as many as seven SEALs who um, we're looking forward to actually serving his command after witnessing what he did indiscriminately, uh, reportedly, shooting unarmed civilians, including a young girl. They went to command and said, this guy's out of control. Um, you got to take this out, guy out of the theater. This is, this is horrific. And they were stunted, but still they had enough integrity to go even a, a level above that, even at risk to their own personal careers. What would the message be here, Gary, if somehow, some way, um, this guy gets a pardon for what he did, and the message it sends to those within the SEAL community, which is as tight-knit as there is, that never mind? Yes, well, I think that that's one of the most pernicious aspects of what uh, President Trump uh, reportedly intends to do, and that is any pardons that he might issue to either Slattern or to... Goldstein, or particularly to uh, Eddie Gallagher, would demonstrate the president's lack of concern for war crimes. He seems to not appreciate that warfare isn't just a matter of killing everyone. He doesn't seem to appreciate that you can commit murder on the battlefield. It creates a climate of uh, criminal conduct on the battlefield. Individuals who see that, well, these guys who have committed these war crimes and have essentially admitted it in each case are getting off scot-free. That leads to an attitude on the part of the troops that, well, war crimes really don't matter that much. And even if they do get turned in for having committed a war crime, hey, the commander-in-chief is going to let us off. I mean, he's calling these guys heroes. You know, I mentioned your background uh, in addition to serving our country with distinction and, and obviously even being a judge in between. You've written books specifically talking about war crimes and with the connection to Vietnam, but you also teach at West Point, which is in our viewing area. And I'm curious, you're training future officers um, and, you know, for, for anyone who can do the math, these are young people in charge of other people and putting them in harm's way and that difficult line where it's not a textbook exercise, but you're now in theater and you have to make real decisions. 
I'm curious, when you get in front of a classroom, if these pardons happen, does it confuse the messaging for future leaders as to what is and is not acceptable when their own commander in chief will label it heroic, um, doing things that have been punishable by law? You know, I think that in the general community of military officers, young military officers, it does indeed confuse them because it sends a mixed message. Not only a mixed message, it sends a negative message in regard to the law of armed conflict. But at West Point, I'm not sure that that can be said. And that's because at West Point, the cadets get a four-year dose of the law of armed conflict or on ethics or on the philosophy of battlefield actions or on et cetera, et cetera. In other words, West Point cadets are trained to a degree far greater than the other incoming junior officers. Uh, they are trained to observe the law of armed conflict and as they say at West Point, to resist the easy wrong and take the path of the harder right. In other words, I don't think that they are as confused as the general population of the junior officer ranks may be by these uh, pardons. And Gary, finally, um, I go back to uh, the robe uh, you wear, and that is, you said it really well, to conflate all these cases under one umbrella. I I'm sure you can find a case where additional uh, military investigations created a jump ball for a particular case that may be a part may even be warranted but to lump them all together and to somehow say whatever you did in the military theater under the fog of war is acceptable that's where this goes from a bad idea to a dangerous idea i think it's just that to try and do this, and at least from the outside, it looks for political purposes, tying it to Memorial Day, and to have a rush on anyone who is accused of anything like this. Um, to me, that's the worst aspect of it, just the coalescing of anything that had to do with anything in the area code of a war crime and giving it basically, you know, carte blanche. Uh, that shows there wasn't a lot of thought put into this. I would agree. There wasn't a lot of thought, and what thought was put into it was uninformed thought and I think that it would do great harm to the military as well as undercutting the uniform code of military justice and the commanders who've made the decision to proceed to trial and this is particularly so in the cases that have not yet been tried you know it's one thing to give a pardon to somebody who has committed a crime in the past and who has rehabilitated him or herself and has now served their sentence and is trying to make it back into society it's another thing to pardon somebody who's not yet gone to trial and as you say is considered to be by the president a hero and not even allow the system which has been put in place by congress as well as the military the uniform code of military justice not allow the system to work and to undercut it and to undercut the commanders who just make the decisions to proceed to trial by issuing a pardon before they go to trial is not only a reprehensible act it's a stupid act. Mm. Well, Professor, I appreciate your time, and also I thank you for your service. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. When we come back, we will get the very latest from Capitol Hill, never dull, as well as the impeachment debate, which is ramping up with even a Republican voice saying he's on board. We'll be joined by our good friend, ABC News political director, Rick Klein.